Hey there, everybody. Welcome to this month's training. It's a topic that is one that is near and dear to my heart. It's something I do a lot. And I am excited to talk with y'all today about going from study to larger painting, scaling up your work, the benefits, mistakes, and the real rewards that you can get from doing that. So first, let's just make sure we know who all is here. And a couple of things that I want to point out that are a little different right now with Zoom or just something we have to watch for. So I know y'all are really used to using the chat role. So if you haven't used it before though, if you're new to the membership, let me just go over that. It's right down here at the bottom if you're on a computer, that idea bubble with three dots in it, that's the chat role. Click on that and the chat role will pop up. The thing that's different right now is that for the moment, for whatever reason, and let me share my screen for a sec so that you can see it too, Zoom is, um, let me just do the desktop, you know, it's in a whole messy desktop here. For some reason, Zoom right now is defaulting to just the panelist, so that if you make a comment in the chat role, the only person who will see it is me. I wanna make sure that everybody can see everybody else's comments, because that's the most beneficial to all of us. So if you will open your chat role right now, then get see that little blue button there, click on that and make sure it goes to all panelists and attendees. Make sure it goes to everybody. That way we'll all be able to see it. So let me know if you're having any trouble doing that. So type into the chat roll if you have any trouble doing that at all. Hey, Mike and Ann and Pam, it's good to see y'all today. So if you have trouble getting that to work, hey Lisa, um, let me know. So again, you just want to open up the chat roll and make sure it goes to, that your comments go to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see that. So now we will dive right in because I've got a lot I want to cover tonight. And I'm not going to actually be demoing, like doing the painting right now, but I'm going to film myself some this month as I work on scaling up a big painting that I'm working on. It's part of a commission that I'm working on so that y'all can see some of what I'm talking about or illustrate some of the points that I'm talking about as we go through these tonight. But I do have some examples to show you as well. So there are some major benefits from working small before you go large. And actually there's some major benefits just to working small. One of the fastest and quickest ways to improve your painting is to paint small and paint often. And the reason that works is that it takes less paint, it costs you less in support materials like the size of the canvas or the panel, and you don't feel as emotionally invested, so you're far more willing to give yourself the freedom to make some mistakes and to experiment. So many of y'all know, I really do push, especially in my courses, that people work small and paint often. So many benefits from doing that. But if you're painting often enough, you're gonna be creating some works along the way that you wanna work on larger, bigger, now, how we all define big can be really, really different. So for some people, bigger is, or big is 16 by 20. For some, it's 32 by 40. For some, it's 64 by 72. It can be whatever is larger than the scale that you're working at at the moment. Now, I don't really think of my little daily paintings as being just studies. I think of them as small paintings that stand on their own. So I think using the word study can be a little bit of a misnomer at times. And I don't want you to belittle any, literally, haha, bad pun, belittle any of those smaller pieces that you're working on. They can stand on their own, but they can also serve as a place to work out ideas for larger paintings. So when you work small first, you eliminate the problems that can, will happen if you just jump straight into the bigger painting. 
So this is a process I've used practically ever since I started painting. I always, and I paint really large at times, like five and a half by six and a half feet. But if you're gonna commit to a really large canvas, a really large panel, that's a lot of expense. And you wanna work out any problems that might occur first before you get started. So what I normally do is that process I always talk about, it, going through and doing a thumbnail study first and pencil drawing, doing a, a study first in my sketchbook. Then what I have done is to do a black and white study on paper and acrylic so that I work out the value relationships. And that usually, if I'm working on a really large painting, will be somewhere on the scale of like a 22 by 30 inch piece of paper like Stonehenge or watercolor paper where I'm really working out all the value relationships. So I'm not having to figure those out on a big old ginormous canvas, because what you don't wanna do is struggle in a really large painting. Work those things out ahead of time. You can work out the value relationships, you work out the composition, so you know where that focal point is gonna be. You know you have a strong composition before you get going. And then a lot of times I'll do a small color study before I actually get to the big painting as well. So when you do that, you're assessing what kind of colors you're going to use. You're figuring out where they're in general going to be placed. And then lastly, a final benefit that I think really is important because it plays into muscle memory. And that is simply getting familiar with the subject. The more you paint a composition, the stronger that painting composition is going to get. So if you work through those issues ahead of time, your final painting is just bound to be better. Some of the major mistakes that I see painters make when they are scaling up is that they try to slavishly copy the study. So what happens is they make a small painting and either they fall in love with it or somebody else falls in love with it and they want a bigger one and say they, they go from like a four by six inch and they want, uh, um, well, not even make it that large, maybe a 12 by 18. That still can be a challenge, especially if you are trying to slavishly copy, just duplicate what you've already done. It never works to try to produce an exact copy of what you've already done. So don't try. So make sure you're not trying to just slavishly copy, like duplicate something you've already done. There's some reasons why that doesn't work. If you're trying to duplicate it, you're gonna get all hung up on mixing the exact same colors, on making the exact same marks and having them go in the exact same directions. And chances are when you first made them, you were feeling much more loose and free with your brush or your knife. And that freedom and that looseness disappears when you try to just duplicate. Duplicating and copying like that does not ever really work. Don't do it, let go of that. Next big mistake I see people make, is that they make a painting with a brush like this, this size, and say it's a, say it's an eight by 10. And they decide they're gonna go up to a 16 by 20. And they're still using this same brush. Does anybody in the group who's watching know why that's not gonna work? Why is it a problem to use the same tool when you scale up, what's gonna happen? Anybody know? Type into the chat roll if, you, if you've ever experienced this little mistake. All of us have done it at one time or another. But what happens when you do that is that the marks that go on the scaled up painting now are tiny in proportion to the overall picture plane. There's no way to duplicate or come close to the same freedom and scale of mark when you haven't upgraded your tool. So don't try to paint it with the exact same tool that you used in painting that smaller one. 
third big, big issue that I see that um, people have when they are scaling up, they get stingy with their paint. And so as they scale up and get stingy with the paint, they mix about the same amount of paint, but they apply it really thinly. And think about a thin painting as being one that's stretched. So if you've ever made a pizza by hand, you know that part of it is stretching out that dough so that it will fit in the pan. So let's think about what happens when you're stingy with the paint and you stretch it out, just like when you stretch out that pizza dough. When you stretch that pizza dough too far, you get a giant hole in the middle. It gets super thin and it pokes a hole in it. Basically what happens when you're trying to paint with not enough paint. You get very thin paint and you lose the textural quality of the paint. You can't have brushwork when you're doing that. It becomes not very rich and it's not a satisfying painting. So that can lead to a whole boatload of frustration. So the things you want to avoid doing, you want to avoid slavishly copying or duplicating the original study. It'll freeze you up. You don't want to use the exact same size tool as you scale up, and you don't want to be stingy with your paint. Instead, there are some things that will really help you be successful as you scale up. The first of those is considering proportions. So when I'm talking about proportions, I'm talking about the relationship of the parts to the whole, but that things are in proportion. So if I used this brush with my original painting, then I need to use this brush in my bigger painting because this brush is more than twice the size of the first brush. I'm trying to look at the camera and here at the screen at the same time. So let me move it so that they're lined up. Do you see what a big difference there is in scale here? This one, I'm not even sure the number is on here. This is a number six and this is a 12. So this is literally double the number, but it, if you look at the size of the brush, it's literally almost four times the size. So you need to scale up with the tool. And you also need to scale up with the way you use it. So if you're using a little brush and you're making smaller strokes that are basically moving your hand, and y'all can't see my elbow, but moving your arm from your elbow. As you go to the bigger brush, the whole body needs to get in there. Your whole arm needs to move from the shoulder. So the larger the tool, the larger the gesture as well. So the way that you paint needs to scale up. It in proportion, just as the tool scales up. So number six to number 12. If you were using a number two, please don't paint with a number two. But if you were using a number two earlier, now you need to be on at least a four by six or a six. That way you're not gonna get frustrated with the scale of the mark. So I know some of you have experimented with knives. I have a bunch of tools here to show y'all because I think tools are really one of the biggest issues that I see people having. So these are two of my favorite tools for using for those small paintings, the small daily paintings and small plein air paintings. And this one, you can see roughly it's about a two inch, inch and a half blade there. This one's fairly small. So these work really nicely on anything from a four by six to an eight by 10. When I go larger, my tools need to go larger and they do make bigger painting knives. So if I'm painting, I don't know if y'all can see the bigger ones that are down there on the floor, but when I'm painting on a larger one and I'm scaling up that much, I need to make sure, I'm missing the wrong, grabbing the wrong knife here, 
that I'm scaling up significantly. So the blade on this one is about half again as much. The handle's much longer. So that means that the mark is gonna be much larger. So it's a very similar type, but a much bigger blade. Then this is another one that has a similar kind of blade, much larger. So they do make the regular painting knives, Blick RGM make those, that are a very large scale. So you can scale up literally with official painting knives. But I think that most of us get hung up as we scale up on thinking they have to be appropriate painting tools, that they must be labeled artist tools, and they don't have to be. So I have some tools here that are not official artist tools that work equally well. So as I scale up on palette knives, one of my favorite tools is this little plastic putty knife that I've gotten from Lowe's and I've gotten them from Home Depot, any of those sorts of stores. They have a similar amount of give as a smaller painting knife. They're a fraction of the cost. A pack of three cost $5 and you get the two inch, the three inch, and a four inch blade. And these hold up really well, working both with acrylics and with oils. And when they don't work anymore, you toss them away. So you don't have to stick to just things that are crafted purely for artists. Look at some other tools as well as you go bigger. So putty knives work. Another tool that works really well, you know, they make these, these are made by Catalyst, they make these large spatulas for artists and they're pricey. I got these as a demo from my art supplier. I don't think I would ever go and pay for them. They're great, but they're expensive. They're silicone and they have these long handles like a brush. They make fantastic marks, that nice long handle. But you can get something really similar. These are real dirty from Target or any other store like Publix or the grocery store. This is a cooking spatula. There's not any difference really between this and this other than the price. So this cooking spatula has some great tips to it and edges that make it wonderful for painting. Works beautifully for painting. Cleans up just like any of the catalyst tools. And spatulas, cooking spatulas, come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And again, you can make very large marks with them. So look at some alternative tools. For alternative tools for regular paint brushes, look at house painting brushes. So when I scale up really large, and we're going to look at a really large one in a minute, I'm not painting with this paintbrush. I'm painting with a house painting brush that's a one to two to four inch house painting brush. And there are places that you can purchase those where they're not very expensive. Here in the States, and they have them in Canada as well, there's a store called Dollar Tree. And all the brushes in there are, guess what, $1. They have some really fine house painting brushes at that particular dollar um, brand store. And you can get whatever size you want for a dollar. I go in there and buy them by the dozen. When they don't work anymore, when they've gotten too goopy with paint, I just toss them. So you can scale up very easily without spending $25 a brush. Now you can get super large official artist brushes, but you're gonna pay for them. The house painting brush will work just as well and sometimes better for a fraction of the cost. So make sure you are scaling up and that you're using tools that are in proportion to the surface you're working with. Let me get those tools out of the way. So tools are a huge big issue. And if cost is stopping you from scaling up, then I want you to look at alternative things. 
like the cooking implements, like spackle knives, all of those things that are not quite as expensive, but will make equally wonderful marks. So you need to scale up the tools. The other thing you need to scale up is very, very carefully is the surface you're painting on. So as you're going larger, you wanna make sure, if you're trying to keep the same composition, that the proportion of the surface is equally large. So I frequently see people take like a five by seven and they wanna put it on an eight by 10. It's not that big an upgrade in scale, but it's a big difference in proportion. A five by seven is not the same proportion as an eight by 10. You're gonna to have to crop off part of it. And if you try to squeeze it in, you're gonna distort. So make sure you're scaling up in proportion. If you're using uh, an eight by 10, go to a 16 by 20, a 32 by 40 and on up. Make sure you're really being careful about proportions so that as you scale up, you're not distorting your image. I don't grid as I scale up. That certainly will work, but it has the tendency of making you slavishly copy the first painting. And remember, that's not a good thing to do. Instead, when I'm scaling up, I will take a photo of the study and I'll divide it into fourths or into sixths. So I'll divide it into thirds horizontally and vertically or in half horizontally and vertically so that I've got some real simple guidelines to go by, just roughly to block it in. And then I will put little tick marks on the big painting at those same intersections so that I can make sure I'm still getting the horizon line in roughly the same place, but I'm getting the big shapes in the same place. So I would not recommend that you take a grid to scale it up because it'll force you into details and to just copying. It'll make you mechanical as a painter. Don't do that. I think it's fine if you're trying to transfer a sketch to the painting, but I think you really do better with the biggest kind of breaking up of that space that you can get away with. And three horizontally and three vertically tends to work really, really well. The last thing you need to think about being very conscious about as you scale up is the amount of paint. So this is one of the things that, excuse me, it, that I see people have a really hard time with. Remember, you don't want it to be too thin. You can't mix the exact same amount and then just spread it out more thinly. You've got to scale up the amount of paint in proportion as well. And your palette may not be big enough. This is something I've been wrestling with with one of my students is that she's trying to scale up literally on some of her smaller studies to a roughly 16 by 20. And her palette's not large enough. So trying to find a palette that's big enough. One of the solutions to that is to use multiple palettes. So if you normally are using something like a Masterson, Masterson box that is kind of um, a little more like an 11 by 14. Sometimes it's about 12 by 16. Get two of them or get two pads of palette paper so that you've got two pads in front of you and put them close together. What you want to make sure you do is that you have enough space between the piles of paint. If you try to squeeze bigger piles of paint closer together, you can't get this big old tool in there to properly load it with paint. So real easy way around that, rather than trying to buy a special palette, which can be expensive, is to just get two pads of the palette paper and put them side by side, or three if necessary. Now, if you want, Get a larger palette. I've got a palette box over there underneath my easel that I believe is 20, it's certainly 18 by 24, and it opens up into double that size. That's a lot of room to mix paint, but it means that I can have the piles far enough apart that they are not, um, my tools can get in there to pick the paint up. 
That's one solution. Multiple palettes, multiple small, regular size palettes. The other thing that I do as I scale up like that, especially if I'm going very, very large, like the one I'm going to show you in just a few minutes, is that I will mix that paint in small containers, even if it's oil. So I will take yogurt containers. How many of y'all eat lots of yogurt? They are, save those containers. They make great things to hold paint in, whether you're working with acrylics or with oils. Save jars like mayonnaise jars, pickle jars, anything like that that you can have a good solid lid on that's gonna keep the paint from drying out. I use cups and then I'll put it back into the glass jar with a lid. But if you have a container that you can seal, then you can actually mix enough paint for a large painting. I limit the number of values and colors when I'm working really, really large like that. So I allow some of the mixing to happen on the canvas instead of on the palette, simply because you can't fit enough of those mixed colors on a flat palette easily, unless you've got the palette box like I do over there. But even then, it can be difficult when you're working super, super large. So make sure you've got a space that you can mix enough paint on and have space between the, the piles of paint. How much space do you need? Well, you pretty much need enough space twice the size of the tool. So if the biggest tool that you're using, for example, is this inch and a half putty knife, then you need to have that inch and a half between each pile at least. So your pile might be an inch and a half because it needs to be to catch the paint. And then you have another inch and a half between that and the next pile of paint. If you don't do that, what will happen is your paint will mix on your palette and everything will be mud. So be really careful with that. Key to not having it all turned to mud, give yourself enough space. And it doesn't have to be an expensive palette. Palettes can be from scraps of plexiglass. You don't have to go buy an official artist palette. If you go to your local glass and plastic shop, like the people who do glass and plastics for doors and for automobile windshields, they frequently will have a bin or a box of scraps. Root through there and you can find some fantastic big pieces of plexi that you can use as a palette. And you might mix all your paint and have it out there while you're painting and then put it away in those jars if you need to have extra sessions. But it will give you a bigger space to paint on. So don't, don't hold in and be um, stingy with either the paint or the size of the palette, but get that bigger palette going, palette mixing space, and give yourself enough space between those piles and it will make a huge, huge difference. So if you let go of copying, if you release the, the need to duplicate what you had in that small study exactly, what you'll find is that it's impossible to duplicate it anyway. But if you allow the happy accidents to occur that are really one of the, the, the things that makes a really strong painting, is to be open to opportunities as they come in the painting, not to over control it. You need to let that happen. And remember that an eight by 10 painting, inch painting is always gonna be different than a 16 by 20, simply because of the scale. So allow yourself to make a new painting that is based on the earlier painting but use the process to improve on your earlier compositions and your designs, to get more familiar with the subject, to assess where you're gonna put the color, to look at those value relationships, and really make sure that your composition, your overall placement is solid. So I wanted to show y'all a set of images of one, it started off as, now why is it not showing? Oh, there it is. Of one that is, um, was a small study first and then became a large painting. 
oops, that doesn't look like it's shared. Let me stop that and try it again. Sometimes the share screen does its own thing. And that looks like it booted Keynote. There we go. So let me know if y'all can see that. Can everybody see the images there right now? Type yes into the chat roll if you can see those. I wanna make sure everybody can see them. Good, excellent, thank you. Thanks Sally and Lisa and Barbie. So the image on the left, the painting on the left is small. It is six inches tall and four inches wide. It's a little. It was done plein air on Edisto Island when I was down there one fall. And so it is a tiny, small painting. I've done several paintings that are based on that painting. On the right is one that, if I remember correctly, is 11 by 14. It may be a little bit larger. I can't remember exactly what scale it is. It's larger, but it's not tremendously larger. So it's, it's multiplied by roughly about double the size. And I altered the composition just a little bit. So you can see I moved the horizon line down a little bit. And I made the sky a little bit more dramatic. So I played around with the value patterns in the clouds just a little bit. But that was not done from anything else but that first study. So it's loosely based on the first one, but it ends up being a different painting and standing all on its own. It's not an exact copy at all. So one of the things I'd wanted to do in that was to move that horizon line down because I thought it focused, refocused the viewer on the sky. And I wanted the sky to have that early morning kind of luminescent light that I just didn't quite capture in the first small painting. So there's a stronger sense of illumination in the second one. It's a little bit different kind of light. It's a little bit more dramatic. It's not an exact duplicate. So in the next image, still see the small painting on the left. But on the right, you'll see the big one that I've been working on based on that small one. And I actually started that one and stopped it. So I started it literally a couple of years ago, put it down and got occupied with working on other things. And I'm going back to that painting. It is, if you can see the scale there, this is the, a big easel. I think that one is four by six. No, it's more than four by six. It's about four and a half by six feet. So it's more of the proportions of an eight by 10. So I've changed the proportions here, but I've tried to work on the composition to play with it a little bit more. So it's just barely blocked in. And I was using big brushes to do that. So I'm not even trying to copy the exact marks that you see in the first painting, but the overall basic composition is the same. So can you all see how those two things relate? And then there comes the point where you're not staring at the first painting anymore because you don't wanna just try to copy it. You're letting the new painting tell you where it wants to go. And maybe looking back at photographic references, but those, this painting, the little one and the bigger one that was double the size, both become references for the really, really big one. So you can see elements of both of them in there. You can see where I'm starting to develop that illuminated light over on the left on the marsh, where there is a little bit of light in the sky, just like in the, the bigger one, and where the placement of the clouds here is more like the original one. So that is one of the ways that I use those little studies to go from four by six inches to four and a half by six feet. You have to let go of the original and let the new one become its own painting. You have to decide how big you want to go. How large do you want to scale up? How, what worked about the first one, what 
doesn't work about it? What do you want to improve on? So one of the first things I would suggest you do if you want to start one that you're going to scale up is to sit with it and your sketchbook or journal. Evaluate what works well already. What about the composition do you like? What do you think you want to hold on to? And what do you want to let go of? An example, this is the one I'm going to be working on some this week. I've intended to do a larger version of this one for a long time. It's another small one. It's postcard size, four by six inches. And it's a storm blowing in over the marsh. So I'm going to build, blow that one up. It's going to be roughly 30 by 40 inches. Again, it's slightly different proportions. It's not quite as wide um, as the final one would be if I kept the exact same proportions, but it's going to be pretty close. So I want you to watch this as I progress through that over the next week or so, and I'm going to be sharing those videos into the membership. But think about what works well here and what I might want to change. Now, one of the things that I've been drawn to ever since I did this one is the dramatic clouds here in the background and the placement of the horizon line. So when we look at this one, that horizon line is at about a fourth line, not a third, but about a fourth. Here's half. So you can see how that's about a fourth of the way up. And I found when I'm painting the landscape of the, the marshes in particular, when I wanna emphasize the sky, it works better for me when I have that horizon line right there at that fourth it creates that dramatic skyline. So I'm gonna keep that, gonna keep the clouds. One of the things that has bothered me ever since I did that, let's get rid of the, these red lines. See if y'all can figure out where it is. There is a section here that just doesn't make sense spatially. Can y'all see where the rain, the cloud is breaking. There's a cloud burst here. The rain is starting to fall. But because it's a study and I did it fairly quickly out of necessity, oops, I moved it. Let me get my annotation tool again. Right here makes it almost look like the horizon line has dropped. And that really bugs me. So I want the distance to show through a little bit more. Can you see the horizon line back there? That's the distant tree line. I need for that to show through a little bit more so that it feels a little bit more anchored and doesn't feel quite as ephemeral. That's one of the beauties of going from study to larger scale. You can figure out what worked and you want to hold on to, and then you can figure out what didn't work that you want to change. So I'm going to, in essence, pull that up, pull where that break is up so it's up a little higher and it doesn't look like the cloud is kind of sending out a foot ahead of itself because that <coughs> that just looks wrong and it really has driven me nuts ever since I did it and that painting is gone I've sold it so I can't look at the painting but I've got really good photographs of it and I've got the original photos that I shot that I um, took as I was working on it, so on site. So I can use all of those as references. So watch for that in the membership as we go through the next few weeks as that painting progresses. You're not gonna be able to paint quite as quickly when you go larger, especially if you go really large, it's not going to happen quite as fast, but it shouldn't happen significantly slower if you've scaled up on your tools. Now, the tool that I used in painting that was that for those first knives that I showed you at the very beginning. So as I go larger, I'm going to be using those big knives that I just showed you earlier. I think I'm probably going to alter the colors in the water just a little bit to darken them up too. If y'all have any suggestions, feel free to hop in. And after we post the replay, give me some suggestions and feedback on what you think I ought to do with that as well. 
So I'll include all of the work that goes along with that one so that y'all can see how I do that. Now I wanted to make sure I left enough time for questions here. Hopefully y'all can't hear the weed eater that has just now decided to start next door. It's almost dark here. I'm not sure why he's weed eating right now. Hopefully you can't hear it with my headphones on. I want to make sure I have time to answer questions. So does anybody have any questions about scaling up and going larger, about moving from small studies to bigger paintings? Some of you have no have done that before. And some of you, I'm going to bug to do it because I know that I've seen some smaller studies you've done that need to be bigger paintings. Don't let it inhibit you and slow you down from doing it because the earlier one was a success and you're worried about doing a bigger one. So I want to hear if anybody has ideas for going larger. Who's going to try a larger one? And Sally, I'm looking right at you. Can you hear me looking at you? That's called the synesthesia, multiple sensory input. I want you to hear me looking at you. You need to be painting some of those studies that you've been doing larger. Yeah, Barbara, do it, definitely, go for it. So I think one of the things that would be really helpful for everyone is if everybody shares their progress as they go through doing that. If you're not sure what small painting that you've done would work larger, share it in the, in the membership. Get feedback from all of us and see what's gonna work the best. So Sally, a five by seven could go up really easily. You'd have a little bit of compositional adjustment if you did like an 11 by 14. You could go to, um, oh, roughly an 18 by 24. It's gonna work too. Any one of those is going to work. I would suggest if you haven't done a whole lot of really large, I would not immediately go from a five by seven to a four by six footer just because that's too big a jump. So as people are working on scaling up, what I usually tell them to do is to double the size of what they're working on. So I think the 11 by 14 would be a really logical thing for you to do, Sally, and it's a standard size. It's going to be relatively easy to find. It's just gonna have a little bit more height than your five by seven does. So you're gonna have to add a little bit on there. Um, don't try to make a huge big leap because what will happen is your brain will freeze. Instead, incrementally work your way up. So if you wanna paint that big four by six foot painting, Start by doubling and then double that and then double that so that you work your way kind of sideways up to the bigger one. That way you won't freeze your brain and you won't freak out. You won't worry about the expense there. Lisa says, I just did a five by six foot painting and shared it in the membership. Hot dog. I have to go look at that now. Excellent. I love working larger. It has its own challenges and it can definitely be a little bit more difficult to sell at times, not all the time. Um, but I think there's a drama to a big painting like that. You remember I said that an eight by 10 is gonna be radically different from the 16 by 20. And that's gonna be radically different from the four by six. And one of the reasons that it is, is a little eight by 10 or even more a five by seven. When it's a small, small painting, then it's going to be personal. People can see the whole thing at one time. They can hold it in their hands. They can get up close to it. When you get to a big painting, it becomes theatrical and dramatic, and it's bigger than the person. So it changes the whole relationship proportionally between the viewer and the painting. Even if it's a really close copy, it'll be dramatically different when you scale it up like that. So I, I think you can be really, you, even just changing the scale will change the painting tremendously. Barbara says, I have a very large one that I put up when we moved and now is the time to get it out and finish. Yes, definitely. And as you do, 
make sure that you get those bigger tools and even just get some big paper and explore some things like the cooking tools like the putty knives you stop sharing the screen there for a minute so that you can see um play with these first where you're not having such a big commitment of monetary stuff you know expensive paint experiment with some less expensive paint first just so you get used to the feel of the tool a bigger tool feels different and a different part of your body moves it so when i'm holding my smaller knife this feels different radically different than this my whole shoulder goes into moving it so you're having to learn a new way to move your body if you don't take that into account you can get really frustrated um sally says i have a bunch of large large ones good um i think if you've got a bunch of large canvases ready to go then experiment with it try it give it a shot and see what happens but scale up slowly don't try to go too big too fast that can be something that really will will call a cause a brain total brain freeze because usually if people scale up too fast they're not scaling up the tools at the same rate and they're not used to painting with that volume of paint so the largest one i've ever done was a whole three walls and it was 20 by 12 by 20 or something like that 20 feet this way then the next wall was 12 feet and the next wall was 20 feet and when you're painting that large regular artist tools don't work anymore so that was when i used even more the big house painting brushes and i used paint rollers and squeegees and sponge mops and brooms even and i took house painting brushes and attached them with duct tape to those extension poles they use for like when you want to dust or paint use a paint roller on the ceiling so there are always ways to improvise and scale up your tools without necessarily having to buy a lot of fancy stuff Sally says, I started a 30 by 40 inch that I never finished and I'll post it. Yes, absolutely. If you've got a big one that you started and you put to the side because you had that brain freeze happen, share it into the group and let's talk about how you can finish it off, what you need to do with it. Usually it's just a matter of getting some bigger tools and having a big enough mixing space. So one solution to a bigger palette that works really really well is to get some cooking sheets whether you're an oil painter or an acrylic painter so you get some cooking sheets you know those big cooking sheets that have a, a lip on them like about that and if they're big enough you can spread your paint out there and you can actually put um, a board down on top of it put vaseline around the edge of that big cooking sheet and then put a board on top of it it seals it just like a masterson box so there are all kind of ways to get around um, the scale issue keep trying to pull my earbuds out any other questions we still have about five minutes so if anybody else has a question pop it into the chat roll y'all have got some great ones so far so i want to urge everybody to think about going larger you can't visualize that which thing can you not visualize sally which part of it um oh the cookie sheet well let me pull one up and then that way it'll be easier for you to see what i mean so amazon is our friend and i am just going to pull up one of those So let me share the screen here and I think you'll be able to see it. And the amazing thing is they're not that expensive when you do that. Some are more expensive than others. So these are baking sheets, cookie sheets, baking sheets. This one is only nine by 13 inches. 
but you can get really large ones. Here you see a set of three that goes quite large. Looking for how large the scale of some of them. Some of them don't list it. This one's 12 by 17. You can go all the way up. What I like about these cooking pans is they have a lid for them. So if you have, say, look at these. If you put three of these side by side, you've got a big working area then. So it doesn't have to be a fancy one. It can be a relatively inexpensive one from Amazon. Probably this one is one of the best, although these are nice because they're deeper. But just scroll through Amazon and see what you find there. I have bought them in the dollar store as well and found some really good ones in the dollar store. So that they were larger, like Masterson size box. Um, Sally says, I have a very large glass palette, but the paint dries out. Yeah, it will. Um, the thing to do, if you've got a really large palette um, and you don't have a palette box for it, then what you're going to want to do is save glass jars. And you're going to want to take your palette knife or your putty knife, and you're going to pull that paint up at the end of each day and put it into the jar because if you don't, it'll dry out. Now, one of the advantages, stop the share again here, see if I can move the camera so that you can see, or move myself. Okay, see the what looks like a wooden suitcase there in front of my French easel? That's my French mistress, and that's the large pallet box that opens out really, really big. When you've got those, they keep the paint from drying out because they close up. And it's not quite as good as a Masterson box, but it still keeps the paint wet for a pretty long period of time. And if you take the felt pads, you know, that you put on the bottom of the feet of furniture, they have a sticky on one side and it's just felt on the other. And you stick those down in each corner of the box and you put two drops of clove oil on each of those felt pads, the paint's not going to dry out when you have, when you, you know, in regular use. So that will help. Yeah, the, the big boxes are great. I love a big palette. Now, I don't like using glass because I'm a klutz. Y'all may be more coordinated than me. Um, and it goes back to teaching in the classroom and using glass palettes and having students knock the glass over and shattering on the concrete floor of the studio and it going everywhere. And I'm really good at cutting myself on glass. So be really careful with that. What goes on top of the cookie sheet? A board. So if you get like a wooden board that's just a little bit larger than the cookie sheet, you put a run your finger around the edge of the cookie sheet with Vaseline on it. That's what works on the Masterson box to keep it sealed. That's the magic sauce to the Masterson box. So if you have a little bit of Vaseline all around that top lip of the cookie sheet or the baking sheet, and you put a board down on top of that, it's a little bit larger. The Vaseline in between the two surfaces creates a seal that locks the air out. Does that make sense? Then your paint's not going to dry out. And that's what works the best with the cookie sheet or the baking sheet. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Vaseline is an amazing thing. It works super, super well. That's the basic principle of the um, Masterson box. Basically, that is just a big old Tupperware container, not much different from, where did that one go that had the lid? I think it was back up here. Here we go. Not much different from these two baking pans that have lids. And these are only nine by 13, but using those lids and using a little Vaseline with something like that would absolutely work. So see what the largest size baking pan is that you can find. And if you want to use that, use a great, oh, the great grand cookie sheet. See, I can go down the, the rabbit hole here 
for a really long time. Doesn't say, uh, it's 14 by 20. That's a great size. That's a fantastic size. It's a good big one. So there are ones out there that come as large as my big old French mistress right there. Yeah, and lips like Vaseline too. It's just good to have in the house. So I, I can digress there as well. So check what you can find on Amazon. Check your local um, store for uh, like Dollar Tree and places like that and see what you can find that will work, that will let you go larger on a palette without investing a whole lot of money. So that'll make it easier. If you have to invest a lot of money, you're liable not to do it. Yeah, Barbara, I have the same experience that when I use the clove oil and the lid that it just lasts for ages and I don't have any trouble with the paint drying out, even the earth colors. So clove oil works gangbusters and thanks to Sheila Walsh for the furniture pad tip. What I had used for ages was, I think it was Sheila who came up with the furniture pad tip. I used um, just Q-tips in the corners with the, the oil on it. And Sheila came up with the, the furniture pad, and that works so much better. Another thing that'll work is a Band-Aid, kind of rolled outward. You can find clove oil at your local drugstore because it's still used for toothache. And you can also find it anywhere they sell essential oils. It's gonna be cheaper in the drugstore, but just the clove oil that you find for that's sold as an essential oil will work. Absolutely, just pay a little bit more for it. And you don't use much. I've had the same bottle for years. You literally use two drops. And definitely don't mix it in the paint because it won't ever dry if you do that. It'll take a really long time to dry. Clove oil has um, a chemical in it that when it off gases, retards the oxidation of the paint. So it just slows down. It fumigates the interior of the paint box and it keeps it from oxidizing and drying out. It's a great, great tool. Plus it makes your studio smell really, really good. So, um, oh, Sally says, your video on burnout made me laugh out loud. Um, which video on burnout was that? <laughs> oh, the one where I was talking about being burned out. Yes, I'm glad it made you laugh. Um, I had definitely got burned out last week. I just got one of those where my brain tied into knots and I froze up and I talk about not having had problems painting in a long time or not getting artist block or not knowing what to paint. Well, that all came home to roost because it definitely hit big time. Yeah. And what solved it was getting my behindy outside and going for walks and not thinking too much and just strolling and ambling. Moving your feet moves your mind for sure. So any last questions about going larger? I'm really hoping to see some scaling up happening in the membership and anytime you run into a problem in there, holler out and ask for some help because one of the benefits of being in a group is you have hive mind. And there are people who've worked at whatever scale it is you choose to go to, whatever size you pick, there's going to be somebody in the group who's explored that. Whichever medium you decide to go to, everybody is going to have somebody out there that matches up with that. Oh, Anne, you just made me laugh. She says, that's mind blowing to think that could happen to you. Yeah, it definitely did. It came home to roost. It doesn't happen real often but it usually happens when I'm trying to do too much or I'm overthinking things and not painting enough and then not painting enough kind of bills on itself. So that I, I just have ways of getting myself out of it that I've developed over the years that work every time. So I definitely get blocked at times. It's just, I know how to find my way back out again. So that's the real key because all of us are going to get blocked at one time or another. But if you know how to get out of it again, you don't stay blocked. So it's not just walking. There are all kinds of other things you can do too, but absolutely. 
So Anne says, I have, a, I did a really big one as a commission a couple of years ago. Can I share that one? Absolutely. Share that away. And you never know, there might be somebody who needs to ask a question about how you did that. Um, share that one, share ones you've done in the past, share ones that you're going to do. And I'll be sure to hit the, remind the whole group when I post in there, the ones, the work in progress that's going to be over there. So thank you for joining us, Lisa, and we'll see you again soon. Um, Sally, so yeah, it, I'm, I'm happy to stay and answer other questions, but if you've got to go, don't feel bad, hop off and just share those bigger paintings as you produce them. Sally says, what are some good earbuds? Oh, I am not the person to ask that. Um, I hate earbuds. I use the Apple ones for my Mac products because so far they're the only ones that fit in my ears. I've got weird ears and I'm always having, you see me doing this a lot. It's because they fall out um, and I don't like wearing them but I'm too vain to wear the regular headphones because they make my hair look bad. So um, my favorite earbuds are headphones because those don't stuff me up and they fit over my ears rather than in my ears. So other than that, I would just get Apple. Those are the only ones that work for me. So yes, they do hurt, Sally. I would agree. And I think you're probably like me have ears that are not, the earbuds are not designed for your ears. And what you might find is that a Logitech headphones work better. Logitech makes, uh, you can get them at Target for like $12. It's just a little headphone that has little sponge ear things that go over your ears. It has a little microphone right there. And you get, um, you don't feel like the ears, earbud things are boring into your head. So yeah, I totally agree with you. I think they do hurt, but I do the ones I've got right now are the most recent Apple design and they don't hurt as much. They just do still fall out a little bit. So hope that helps. And y'all have a fantastic rest of the week. I look forward to hopefully seeing some of those as we get to the critique and Q and a later in the month, but have a fantastic time scaling up and look forward to talking to you then. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now.